Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, what we're gonna do is directly compare two very similar drivers. Um, this is the Dayton Audio RS100. It's an aluminum cone. And Dayton Audio happens to make a paper version. It's the RS100P. And the only difference is, is that the actual diaphragm is paper instead of this anodized black aluminum. And so in this blog post, what I'd like to do is do some direct comparisons in terms of measurement, also with listening, and then see if there's one that's better than the other and then if that correlates with our measurements. Um, I'll also continue the discussion about measurements and uh, how this plays into the overall design process when looking at designing a loudspeaker. So the Drivers are quite highly reviewed on the Dayton Audio, or sorry, the Parts Express website. Um, you can see here that it's got 95 reviews for the 4 ohm aluminum cone version, but the others are just, uh, just as highly regarded uh, based on the user reviews. And so they're, they retail for about 50 US dollars each, and so they fit into kind of the more affordable, kind of mid-range, I guess, category for price. And so based on the reviews and that they do seem to be highly regarded, I felt like it was a great opportunity to do a direct comparison between the two different materials for the diaphragm. And so we know that based on the reviews that there is not going to be a bottleneck in terms of sound quality that might prevent us from making a kind of a fair comparison. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do was look at the manufacturer's published data for the drivers and so you can see here I'm just going to zoom in a little bit you can see here the parameters are virtually identical with the exception of the moving mass where the aluminum version is a higher moving mass and as a result um, it's claiming that the sensitivity is 1.6 dB lower for the aluminum version otherwise everything seems to be identical um, looking at the published frequency response data from Dayton Audio, you can see here that they're saying that there is a breakup at around 17 kilohertz for the aluminum. However, when we look at the paper, overall it appears to be a more well-behaved driver, more linear response through the mid-band, and then the breakup, if it is actually at this 10 kilohertz region, it seems to be quite well damped out. And so if you're kind of a potential customer trying to decide which one would be appropriate as far as sound quality, then it would lead you to think that the paper uh, might be better if you're just strictly looking at the published frequency response data. Okay, so for my measurements, um, I mounted the driver to my 90 by 90 centimeter test baffle. The microphone was placed at 60 centimeters and for the distortion measurements, it was placed at 10 centimeters or in the near field. So this allowed me, sorry, with the 60 centimeter mic distance, it allowed me to get a clean gate of 4.2 milliseconds. You can see here, I did mount the driver to an adapter plate, which is a 12 millimeter thick plywood piece that measures 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters. And so it's on my index table, which allows me to get polar off axis every five degrees out to 90 degrees. So you can see here on the back of the baffle, it is in a 9.4 liter sealed enclosure, which is 100% filled with polyfill. So looking closely at my test data, I was able to splice the result. So below 1.4 kilohertz is a near field smooth result. Above the 1.4 is a gated 24 dB octave smoothing result, and I have the on axis 15, 30, and 45 off axis. So what we can what we can conclude from the measurements that I've conducted is that there is indeed a breakup occurring with the aluminum at around 17 kilohertz, so it's outside of the audible band. Um, we see the similar kind of intensity of a breakup with the paper, however, at 10 kilohertz. And so that's something that wasn't quite well reflected in the manufacturer's published data, but we see it there. Um, off axis otherwise looks uh, very similar in that once you get to 30 degrees off axis, um, it's going to be completely uh, narrowing in the upper treble as a result. And so this is typical of any full range driver, you're going to get that narrowing of directivity. So doing an overlay between the two driver materials, you can see here that the aluminum driver is in fact 2 dB less sensitive than the paper. Um, but to more fairly compare, um, I decided to shift the, in the graph settings in ARTA, I shifted 
the aluminum response up to be 2 dB to properly align so we can make uh, just visually a, an easier comparison. And so you can see here that they actually align almost identical leading up to the breakup uh, with the paper occurring earlier than the aluminum. Another thing that I looked at was the directivity index. And so this is something that I'm going to start doing consistently moving forward where I bring in the off-axis test data from Arda. I bring it into the Vituix CAD software, which automatically calculates uh, the IEC standard, including the directivity index, the in-room response. Um, you can see here in the legend all of the different attributes that it's producing, which is, you know, there's a lot of science tied to this. And if you want more information, then I'll put a link to Floyd's seminar here about the directivity index and the listening window. It's a great explanation and uh, it's something I think I'm going to con continue to do. Provides a little better visibility on the test data that's, that's relevant to spaciousness um, and in-room, kind of how we perceive the overall timbral balance in-room. So. So as noted, um, there is significant narrowing of the directivity. However, we do see that the paper, because of the breakup mode occurring at that 10 kilohertz region, we see an even more aggressive narrowing of the directivity as a result. So here we see the paper driver, we can see directivity really spiking at around the eight or nine kilohertz region, uh, where with the aluminum, it's a little less pronounced, uh, looking at the time domain with the burst decay, uh, definitely seeing the mechanical breakup of the diaphragm coming in on the burst decay for both drivers uh, with similar intensity. However, we, will, we do note that the paper actually seems to have a cleaner decay through the mid-range. However, when we look at the CSD plot, um, the tables turn a little bit and the aluminum driver appears to be a little cleaner through the mid-range. And so kind of neck and neck with looking at the test data, trying to pull out if there's a significant uh, winner here and it doesn't appear to be the case. So the same actually again when it comes to harmonic distortion, measuring in the near field at 75 and 85 dB. We can see that generally there is not a clear winner here. They both have very similar distortion profiles in terms of the third and the fourth harmonic. Uh, intermodulation distortion, again, uh, same conclusion here that the distortion profile, you can see here the up and downs in the IMD on the paper uh, with the aluminum having a more kind of natural rising noise profile. Um, but in terms of absolute distortion performance, they both have similar results. Same again for the Gedley, um, kind of neck and neck in terms of where we're seeing the Gedley distortion in terms of the frequency response um, or the frequency spectrum. There doesn't appear to be any clear winner. I think what we're seeing here is just simply the uh, breakup occurring earlier in the paper diaphragm. So for subjective listening, I set them up in a sealed enclosure uh, and directly kind of compared back and forth uh, between the aluminum and the paper. At one point we had the left speaker aluminum and the right uh, paper, and then we listened to them as a stereo pair with each material. And I say we, um, my two employees, Emerson and Daniel, they sat down as well and listened and we kind of drew similar conclusions was that there really was a discernible difference in the tonal character of each material, um, but it, we were all three of us were basically on the fence as to which one was actually better. Um, Emerson, even when he sat down, he initially thought that the paper sounded better, but then after listening to a couple songs, he decided that he preferred the paper. So that's where we're at. The measurements obviously show that there is a dis you know, a measurable difference between the drivers. However, it's completely within that realm of personal preference. Um, so there's such a small difference between the two drivers in terms of listening and measurement. Uh, despite the earlier breakup of the paper version, the sound was still, uh, I would say, equal to that of the aluminum. As a result, uh, scrutinizing differences in driver diaphragm material falls, like I mentioned, into the category of personal preference. And so there's no kind of right or wrong uh, here in terms of choice. Um, so 
In fact, the, the beginning stages of design development include careful observation of various driver attributes. So this includes distortion performance, the output capability of the driver, the directivity characteristics. All of these, I would say, I would call these macro attributes are essential when determining the subjective sound quality goals. So for example, a, a narrow directivity, such as what we see here, uh, will result in a more forward sound character and less spaciousness. So spaciousness is what we subjectively prefer uh, based on Floyd Toole's studies at the NRC. And so I put a link there to his book, which I uh, strongly suggest you take a look at and read through. So in this uh, this is in alignment with my overall design goals as well. So other critical aspects, for example, would be the maximum distortion limited output of the particular driver. Um, this attribute directly affects the sense of dynamics and resolution, uh, particularly with bass and mid bass frequencies. So for example, if a driver is approaching the threshold of distortion, then it's not going to produce an quote, effortless sound. Neither will it be authentic, accurate, or even enjoyable. So in the context of overall great subjective sound quality, this format, i.e. a 10 centimeter full range driver, has inherent limitations beyond simply looking at the diaphragm material. So it's important to highlight this context, okay? So in other words, changing or modifying this 10 centimeter format will not miraculously provide wide coverage or low distortion and all of the enjoyments that follow as a result of that, which is spaciousness and nuanced mid bass, for, for example. So it's simply an inherent limitation of the physical format. So from a design standpoint, it would be much better to incorporate the RS100 or the RS100P driver as a dedicated mid-range. So it could be taken even further by simply upgrading to a higher performing driver model. So for example, if we look at the raw test data conducted um, about a year ago on the SB Audience 5-inch TechStream mid-range, we can see that this particular model of driver excels meaningfully over the entire performance metric. And so I've just pasted here um, the actual test data from that blog post. And so you can see that the response is very linear uh, across its you know, mid-range, because it's a dedicated mid-range driver, time domain is superior, and then especially distortion. If you look at the harmonic distortion between these RS100 drivers and this five inch text stream, then the distortion is significantly lower. And so it comes as no surprise since the driver is physically larger. It doesn't have the uh, a bullet phase plug, which reduces the SD radiating area of the driver. And so it's gonna have more radiating area, it's physically larger, and so of course it's going to have lower distortion. The diaphragm material itself is a higher Young's modulus, it's, it's stiffer, the, the, the stiffness to weight ratio is superior to that of both aluminum and paper. It has copper shorting rings in the motor structure, and this is just to name a few of the features of this particular mid-range driver. Um, you know, that contributes to its overall uh, superior raw test data that we're seeing on this driver. So this is not to discredit what the RS100 and the 100P represent, but it's to highlight that it has its place in the audio food chain. And that, and that design decisions made early on should focus on the raw test data of each driver and what each one offers along with how it integrates into a final solution. So i.e. full range, multi-way multi or horn loaded. So not to labor the point here, but it becomes clear when you look at very specific test data. So for example, I've, in, I've imported the ungated polar response data of the RS100 uh, into Vitux CAD. And so the on axis is shown in red and it's smooth just to highlight what I'm trying to say here and not get carried away by the, the, the you know, the small details. So it, it, it's in contrast to the green, which is the in-room response. So if you see the in-room response, it's completely shelved down starting at five kilohertz. So this is the core issue of directivity in that the directivity index performance 
um, which is shown in blue. So I've, I've just added another trace into the same graph and you can see the directivity index and how it is flat until around three kilohertz and then it, can, it aggressively narrows. And so this is expected, like I mentioned, with full range drivers, but it's clearly shown uh, as a visual representation of the driver. If we were somehow to able to flatten this blue curve, widening the off-axis coverage, then we would see an improvement in spaciousness as well as timbor timbral accuracy. And so this is what Floyd Tool touches on, and I'll post a link to uh, the video. I've jumped ahead uh, in his video to the 25-minute uh, mark, just where he talks about the uh, how we're going to perceive the sound in the room. I, I'll make a video on, on this as well as in terms of how to interpret these results in Vitux CAD and how to bring them in. Let's do a separate video on that. Uh, but for today, um, the point being is that contextualizing performance between macro and micro issues is important in the design development process. The macro issues, which are in, in uh, it's directivity, smooth linear response, low distortion are, are core aspects to focus on early on. Only then can a design progress towards micro changes. And in the case of this particular blog post or blog video, um, the, these and these specific drivers, diaphragm material is a perfect example of the micro changes that one can make that comes down to personal preference. Yes, the speakers are great within the context of what they can do as a 10 centimeter full range driver. Um, they lack spaciousness simply by virtue of the narrowing directivity. So going to a multi-way just kind of provided a much more spacious sound that was more relaxing and for me personally more enjoyable to listen to. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, like I mentioned, I'll do some more kind of educational videos on the Vitux CAD side of things and being able to produce those very informative uh, graphs that show the directivity index of the overall polar response of the speaker. So take care and have a great day.